Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And I'm Megan Rathbun, the curator for the USS Missouri Memorial. People ask us all the time if we work with other historic ship museums, and uh, we most assuredly do. Megan, how often do we talk in any given week? Daily. And daily, most absolutely. Likely. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And sometimes we visit each other. I'd prefer to visit you, but uh, welcome yeah. to Philadelphia. Yeah, a visiting family on the East Coast. So, so today's video, we're going to talk about Mazora's grounding incident when she was the only commissioned battleship in the U.S. Navy. So when did this happen? January 17th, 1950. Where was Mazora operating at the time? So she actually was just leaving a yard period in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, heading out to actually go down to Cuba to do some training um, and she ran aground right at Thimble Shoals right when you start to leave the Norfolk, Norfolk Naval and Chesapeake Bay area to get out. Um, it's a very dangerous area I say. Uh, I, I'm a Norfolk native. I grew up there. Um, yeah, there's a lot of shoaling um, and she fell victim to it. Now the, the channel there is marked to try and prevent this from happening. Yes. There are danger shoals marked. Um, the shoaling does shift, um, but not in a way that would impact the channel that much. Um, but yeah, you're right, it is marked. Um, and it was marked that day. Is it marked clearly? Where, where did we get into an issue here? So it was, the entire situation just kind of can be summed up very easily in a failure of communication. So as Missouri was getting ready to go out and run down to Cuba, um, the Navy had given them an optional um, opportunity to run an acoustic range. Now what the Navy was looking for, for Missouri to run this acoustic range, what they'd done is they laid these cables and they were just listening and what they wanted to capture was the sound of Missouri's propellers. They were doing a lot of studies into that and they just wanted her to run this acoustic range. Um, now the acoustic range typically was marked by five buoys. Mm -hmm. um, the Navy had positioned them precariously close to the danger shoaling and the danger buoys. Um, the day before, some of Missouri's crew had received word that actually three of these buoys had been removed and they were only going to have two of the buoys on the range, but they were not given permission to amend their charts. Um, Missouri was in prep for going into Cuba, so mm -hmm. a lot of things kind of took precedence at this point, and then January 17th, as they're heading out, Missouri starts to turn to run this acoustic range. Um, there was debate amongst the command and control staff um, whether or not what speed they should be running it. Mm -hmm. um, the captain made the order for 15 knots. They ended up doing about 12, which is far too fast to run in that area. Um, and they didn't realize that there were only two buoys instead of you know the five that they thought were on the charts, um, and Missouri essentially ended up swinging too far beyond those buoys right into that danger shoaling area. And by the time the executive officer and some of the other members of the crew realized what was going on and were trying to relay their orders to correct the ship's course, it was far too late. But it takes a very long time for a battleship to stop, especially when they get going. 12 knots is no slow speed for a ship of that size, even though Iowa's can go quite a lot faster. Um, so by the time Missouri came to a stop, she had plowed a channel 2,500 yards through the shoaling and pushed herself seven feet above her where her water line was. Um, and just to give you an idea of that sheer amount of speed and weight of that ship and what she was able to do to ground herself. So uh, a ship like that doesn't ground herself without causing damage. What happened? So initially, they didn't report really any damage um, beyond the damage sustained to some of the intake valves and pumps. They couldn't run the engine because all of those intakes are sitting in silt and sand, so you can't bring in the water you need to run um, your engines. So that became an immediate issue, so they started to have to run their um, emergency diesels. Eventually, Kitty Hawk is brought alongside to run power mm -hmm. to Missouri. Um, some of the other damage wouldn't become apparent until they actually managed to refloat her. Um, but they were worried about there was burnout of pumps and things like that just because of the nature of having all of this complex machinery running, doing 12 knots, and suddenly having everything full of sand. I heard that uh, the engineers 
like pretty immediately knew what was happening and shut down their plants to prevent it from getting a lot worse? They did. And there's a lot of things that battleship sailors have reported on to people like us about how they know um, the helmsman, for instance, on Missouri was able to feel something was wrong because she wasn't responding the way she should, which meant that there wasn't enough water under her for mm -hmm. her propellers and her rudders to be doing what she needed to do um, to maneuver. Um, and then, you know, engineers are able to tell pretty quickly when something's going wrong, especially, you know, with all those very sensitive intakes, they do have sometimes maybe a covering on them, but a lot of times there's already sucking up sea creatures into yeah. those intakes. Um, so as soon as you start to get sand or any sort of other debris, you're really going to have a hard time. Um, so they'll shut them down pretty quickly as soon as they start watching their pressure gauges and things. So, uh, the, the ship is aground now. And, uh, so w what are some actions that the crew takes that they've essentially got a dead ship they can make some electrical power and get mm -hmm. some auxiliary systems online with the diesels so they run into this immediate issue of when you're trying to pull a ship like that back out i mean 2500 yards into the shoaling um pretty stuck pushed that seven feet up i mean the other issue being that this was a historically high tide so mm. there was going to be even less water under the ship as the days went on the crew immediately needed to think about how they were going to be part of the salvage effort to get Missouri refloated again. And one of the first problems is that Missouri was fully fueled up, full of ammo, full stores, because she's going down to Cuba. So she has to offload all of the fuel, all of the water, all of the stores, every single piece of ammunition, 16 inch, five inch, down through your uh, quad 40s that were still on board in this period. Um, so this is a monumental effort. You think about how difficult it is to, you know, bring a battleship up to speed to go out to sea, and then you've got to sit here and do it in reverse in a way they don't normally do when they're coming back to port. Um, so that's just a huge effort, and they can't, they don't have a pier there. They don't have the cranes they need to offload all of this. So instead, they've got to pull all these support ships up and be offloading everything onto these support ships. And, and these ships have to have a shallow enough draft to come up alongside. You can't just bring yep. a resupply ship alongside like you're doing an unwrap. Yep, So because they're in the shoal water, um, it's for a ship that's got it maybe 10 foot, maybe 20 foot draft. But again, you've got to watch those tides because if you go into that low tide area, you can get another ship stuck, uh, which didn't happen, thankfully. But so the crew has done their work. They've pumped off all the oil. They've offloaded all the supplies they can to make the ship as light as possible. Was that enough? No. It, that would be easy. Um, <laughs> so it took multiple efforts to refill Missouri before they finally were able to free her. Um, and they brought on huge winches and equipment onto the deck so they could run these huge cables out to tugs and to other ships pulling. Some ships ended up pushing. Um, at one point, the Navy detonated charges around the Missouri to try and release some of that suction because she's not sitting on sand. This is silt and mud, and it's got that suction that's holding the ship there. Um, and then they, you know, they were trying anything they could at this point. So they did those um, charges to try and maybe dislodge the ship. Um, and during their efforts, the Navy received around 10,000 tips from the general public um, on ways they thought that they could refloat this ship. Um, and some of them are very interesting. Some are from former sailors who wrote in and said, I was part of refloating these ships down in the Pacific during World War II. I know how to do that. Or, you know, just your average American thinking and racking their brains, seeing if they could help. Um, so they're fielding all of that. And, you know, who would think blowing charges next to a battleship would be something to do, but uh, they tried it. Um, and the, f the last main effort they tried, um, they really thought it was going to go before the ship was freed. Um, but the ship moved a little bit, um, but then got stuck again. And to facilitate even moving this ship, they had to dig out a channel behind her. So they had to do dredging work before they could even refloat her because even though she'd plowed her way in, that water was you know lower at this point. So they wanted to make sure that they could pull her all the way back out to the channel and not get her stuck. She did get stuck, started, got stuck again. And then eventually, two weeks later, uh, February 1st, they were able to free her. Um, and that's when they found the actual damage to the ship. Um, which had been masked mm -hmm. because it's all down in her hull down underneath which had been stuck to that mud silt bottom so it was creating a watertight seal 
So when they pull the ship out, suddenly there's this huge scratch in the hull and a pretty big gash and it floods three compartments. Um, nothing too terrible, but still not great. Is this just part of the triple bottom or does it defeat that protection system and get into the habitable part of the ship? It doesn't get into the habitable parts. It's down in those fuel tanks and things mm -hmm. down there. Okay. Um, but it's still not great. Um, and if you look at the Navy salvage report for the Missouri, there's some speculation as to what that gash is actually from. Um, like I said, I'm from that area that's known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. Um, shipwrecks are incredibly common because of that shoaling. Um, so there's speculation that the Missouri, part of the reason they had such a difficult time pulling her out was because she got stuck on an anchor from a sunken ship there and that's what tore that gash. Or she hit a, a big rock or another ship that had sunk at some point in the past. It's all completely plausible. Um, and that's, you know, contributed to her damage. But there was other damage as well, um, which is a, a direct result of the salvage operation rather than the actual grounding itself. Um, so to get Missouri unstuck, they mm -hmm. put tugs on her bow, mm -hmm. wiggling. So they're pushing back and forth to try and wiggle Missouri out. Oh no. Yep. And then they have tugs at the back. They're all pulling Missouri back. Um, so some of the more interesting damage, um, and I honestly don't know if this is the reason why these were replaced in the 80s, um, but um, propellers or screws two, three, and four all sustained damage um, from the cables and everything pulling um, the Missouri free. So nothing terrible, but there were chips and some bins mm -hmm. into those. Um, it is really important to note, um, a lot of people speculate or say that the Missouri, as a result of this grounding, was never able to obtain her full speed again, or that, you know, they were worried about that. Um, but there wasn't anything significant enough to cause that level of damage to the Missouri. So she was able to hit, you know, quite high speeds again later in life. I've heard that and I've never heard any justifications for why that was. No, but there is there is a crack in the barbette um, and a lot of people attribute it to the grounding. I've heard that as well. It's not from the grounding. So there's a quite a large crack in the barbette. It's still there if you know what you're looking for on the Missouri. It's very hard to spot. In fact, I didn't even see it myself. I had a coworker point it out to me. Um, essentially, Missouri's armored steel was made at a different factory than her three sisters. So her steel's made at Midvale. And the way Midvale goes about their process meant that the steel started to separate um, during the cooling process. Missouri actually has a lot of these cracks in her armor. And during the 1980s when they were bringing her back, they were inspecting all of these cracks. They are not structural, they don't impact anything. Um, and so this crack in the barbette is from her initial casting phase with that armor. So before she was ever completed and commissioned and put out as a U.S. naval vessel, she had that crack. Um, the grounding didn't affect it, didn't make it worse, it didn't put any stress on the turret, though they did worry it may have because they were wrapping co um, cables around turret three, mm -hmm. but it didn't impact it at all. Um, and in the 80s, um, Landgraf, who if you're a battleship person, you will know that name, he was brought into Long Beach Naval Shipyard and he actually put a marine grade epoxy over the crack, sanded it and made it flush again. So you can see that flat area. It's the only part of the barbette that's flat and not the dimpled from the sand casting. Um, and they did that in some of the ar other armor on the ship as well. And if you come and visit New Jersey, especially um, her, her thickest armor plate, you, you can see that, uh, that there are cracks and indents there. You can, even if you look closely, you can see places where it's been machined down to a uniform thickness or, or to mate with other pieces of armor or where it's uh, ve very rough from the casting process. So any one of the Iowa class battleships, whichever one's closest to you, you can go out and, and see similar cracks. So uh, before we finish out here, let's go back to what you said 10 minutes ago about uh, everybody writing in about this mm -hmm. um, with their opinions. The, that's really interesting to me. The Navy put the guy in charge of this process who was in charge of salvaging the, the sunk battleships at Pearl Harbor. Yes. So they, they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there was so much interest? This is a surrender ship. I mean, Missouri was known the world around by this point. You know, this is the place where World War II officially ended. Um, and so in the U.S., there was a lot of pride for that ship. Everywhere she went drew huge crowds. Um, so I think there was a lot of interest in seeing her refloated. Um, and I mean, I know, for instance, my family, mm -hmm. again, I'm from Norfolk, they went down to see her stuck because you could see her from the shore. 
Um, so I asked my uncle actually the last time I saw him if he had had gone to see the Missouri. He said, yeah, he remembers going as a little boy and his dad taking him and, and seeing um, Missouri sitting there as they were trying to, to free her. Um, and so I think it really captivated people in the United States, you know. That, that's something that's really interesting to me because most of the, the famous ships out there that uh, anybody off the street could name, your Bismarcks or your Titanics, they're famous because they sank. Uh, and Missouri is one of a very, very small handful of ships that the average person could name mm -hmm. uh, because of her involvement in a historical event that didn't involve also a wrecking event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she didn't sink. Um, she just sustained uh, some damage in World War II, but otherwise largely unscathed through two more engagements and yet defeated by some shoaling <laughs> off uh, beyond, uh, Virginia. So, uh, obviously, Missouri's returned to service. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the acoustic range mm -hmm. technology works. We, we have a SOSIS network that we still use today to monitor mm -hmm. um, submarines and other craft going across the Atlantic, the Pacific. Um, so, so that technology worked. What are some results of this incident? So after the Missouri was freed, there was an investigation into what went wrong. Um, and like I said at the beginning, it was down to a communication error. There were a lot of people and a lot of just moments where things could have been communicated better aboard the Missouri. The charts should have been amended to show that there were two buoys, not five. Um, they should have known the speed to run. They should have let everyone in the command structure of the battleship know they were going to be running this acoustic range. There were several key members who were never told this. Um, and then there was should have been better relaying from some other members of the crew who noticed something wrong. For instance, down in CIC, there was um, a sailor who noticed that the radar was making it look like she was going into really shallow water and maybe they should be concerned about that. But instead of relaying that information, he just assumed that his radar was malfunctioning. So there was just a lot of opportunities um, where things could have been communicated better and potentially this could have been avoided. Um, and then eventually, you know, there was an investigation into the command structure of the Missouri. Um, Interestingly, the executive officer, Peckham, who is one of our biggest stoners at the ship, was completely exonerated. He did everything in his power to try to avoid it. And um, he, most of our documentation from this grounding actually comes from him. He saved everything down to the telegrams that people sent in, which is just an amazing resource. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're great fun to read. Um, uh, that's very interesting. So like, the, the communication issues, are they... Navy communicating to the ship, they're not getting to the right person, or is it purely intra-ship? It's a bit of both. Okay. Um, it's a little bit of both. So the range was optional, but I don't believe some of the command structure realized it was optional. Um, but also just not having clear instructions for the buoys was something that should have been communicated by the Navy. Um, but then as the ship was actually underway, there were some failures in communication within the actual um, command structure of the Missouri. Um, so people just not listening or not relaying information as they're seeing it. And as you know, battleships are huge ships and steering them and, you know, correctly navigating them, especially through really dangerous areas, is something you really have to be careful with. They don't respond the way a smaller ship does. It takes them a lot longer to turn. It takes them longer to stop. So you really have to have a really firm grasp on what's going on. And so for the situation where there was so many factors where the, there was questions, it just set Missouri up for something to happen. And, you know, down to, you know, the Navy setting up this acoustic range so close to danger shoaling. You know, that's already putting a big ship like Missouri into a situation that is less than ideal. And, and you have to have a scapegoat when something this public happens. And I know a number of people were uh, brought up on court martials mm -hmm. or reprimanded in other ways. Yeah. Uh, so obviously something like this happens the first thing you do get rid of the captain mm -hmm. it's usually you get rid of the entire command structure so it's really interesting that the xo uh is exonerated completely um he did some interesting things like i said we have his entire record so we have everything we know exactly what went on and one of the interesting things personally that i find that he did it was as soon as he noticed the ship ran aground he was on the 04 bridge mm -hmm. the captain and everyone else was on the 08. okay on the 04, he stopped and he told everyone there, stop what you're doing, 
write down what you just did. Write down exactly what you did, save your logs, save your charts. So he already knew that obviously there's going to be an investigation. Everyone on the ship could have known, but he had the presence of mind to sit down and be like, everybody take a second. This is really important to get this right. Um, and so he submitted all of his information. And so there was a lot of people who came out and said that he did everything he could to prevent it. Um, eventually, you know, there was an investigation and several members of Missouri's crew were um, bumped down in the promotion list, you know, which is a big deal when you're, you know, 20, 25 years in the Navy. Um, so they were bumped down into that very low down onto that um, promotion point list, which is essentially a huge reprimand. So the executive officer was one of the people who didn't know the acoustic range was being run. He was not informed. So problem one, he noticed the ship swinging towards the danger shoaling and issued several course corrections that were then overruled. Because the captain had the con. Yep. And so he, in fact, at one point went from the 04 to the 08 because he was afraid his orders weren't being relayed um, because of the, the talkers up there and then came down and did everything he could to try and avert this and to try and turn the ship from the course that she was heading. So he did everything he could have done with the information he had available to him. Um, there was a breakdown in, in some of the people relaying the information between the two bridges, obviously from people looking at equipment like radar and, mm -hmm. you know, other places and even the charts, you know, people not realizing what was really going on there. Um, so Peckham really, really tried to do what was right in that situation and was ultimately exonerated. And he actually took over as acting captain for a little while um, after the ship ran aground, um, eventually replaced by someone else. But yeah, his, his uh, forethought to save everything um, was incredibly vital, one, to the investigation afterwards, but also for us as an organization, we have such a rich amount of documentation for this incident simply because he saved it. Now we have like every single newspaper that came out of Norfolk, Virginia <laughs> in this time, um, the Norfolk Star Ledger and the pilot, whatever the pilot used to be, um, if anyone lives in that area, um, we have every single news article about it. But what is so fantastic about Peckham is he saved every bit of documentation from the investigation into himself which gives us a great look at to what was going on on the bridge that day. That is uh, incredibly important for us as historians to have individuals like that who, who, who save things, especially when you're involved in a historic event like that. And so uh, before starting as the curator on Missouri, mm -hmm. you also worked on Wisconsin. And uh, I understand she had a grounding issue too. Uh, yes, so I did work on Wisconsin, like I said, from Norfolk, um, so she's right there in my hometown. Um, my mom let me watch her come in, actually, when I was a kid, when they brought her in to be a museum, which was fantastic. Um, but uh, Missouri may have ran aground and stayed there for a week, but Wisconsin ran aground twice. Once in the same spot that Missouri did, and once in the mud flats off New York. So she, she did do that twice. Um, not for anywhere near the length of time that Missouri did, just a couple hours, I believe, in both cases. Um, but she did do it twice. Well, someone from Baltimore, I can understand why you wouldn't want to go to New York and you'd do everything in your power to stay away. But uh, what are the circumstances surrounding her running aground in the Chesapeake Bay? Um, I'm not quite sure. I think it's just more of that shoaling and just it was nowhere near, obviously, the, the sheer velocity and just amazingness with which Missouri got stuck. So she was only stuck for a couple hours and in the water she was able to get refloated pretty easily. So it's just a quick little issue. Like I said, that is a really dangerous area for shipping. Um, it really is the graveyard of the Atlantic. It goes, you know, Virginia Eastern Shore all the way down through North Carolina. It's just so dangerous there with the shifting sands. These big sandbars come up and the shoaling and everything. So they do their best to keep the charts amended and, but still mother nature has a way. So. I'm Ryan Szymanski from Battleship New Jersey. This has been Megan Rathbun from Battleship Missouri. Which battleship do you like better? Missouri, New Jersey, or a different one? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of businesses and individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate the support you guys have given us. There's a link in the description for ways that you can support Battleship New Jersey and another link for ways you can support Battleship Missouri. Another way you can support us is by clicking the like, share, and subscribe buttons. That way more people hear about us, it helps us out, and it'll help you out because you'll get notified every time we're posting new content. Thanks for watching.